First of all, hello. My name is uh, Huy Vo. I'm a research scientist from uh, the Center for Urban Science and Progress, NYU, and also a research participant at uh, Poly. Today, I want to discuss uh, our recent work on visual expression of urban data, particularly on the NYC taxi data, using one of the tools that we developed, is taxi list. So uh, a little bit of background about me is uh, I'm doing research in uh, big data visualizations and analysis. We focus on interactive uh, applications, and also doing on high performance computing and you know, scalable displays, like you know, the smartphone display or mobile phone display as well. So the, the thing is that I do a lot with, uh, let's say, uh, system level programming. So I'm a C person, so I love working with C. But I also do love Python, to be honest. And those are the two languages I use, C and Python. Of course, I cannot say it on my computer. So I love Python. And I was also one of the, the, the core developers of Visceral, which is a system for managing uh, problems uh, and uh, scientific workflow. So the entire framework was written in Python. And we, we have a lot of experience, fun experience with uh, PyQt, Matplotlib, or how to wrap visualization with VDK, so stuff like that. And I could have talked about uh, this trails and our experience in this talk, but I guess we're in New York City, city right? It's a big city, urban area, so let's talk about big city, big urban data, and how to analyze those. So there will not be a lot of Python stuff on my talk, but I will say how we want to tie to Python later. So let's bear with me again. Since we talk about uh, urban science, so let's give a little bit introduction to CUSP. So CUSP is a new research center, only for two years. And we're focusing on uh, collecting uh, urban data and make use of that data to really instrument the cities and develop new techniques to improve the, the uh, life of the citizen. So it is a multi-sector collaboration. We're not doing this alone, right? So uh, we have a lot of connection to agencies, uh, city agencies like DOT, NYPD, fire departments, where we really uh, uh, collect the data using their data for our analysis. And we also are multidisciplinary uh, uh, organizations because we're pulling uh, researchers from all of the domains, like civil engineering, machine learning, computer scientists, so all of those. And um, our goal is to really develop new process and make New York City into lab, and then applying those techniques to all the cities as well, like London, you know, Mumbai, Beijing, et cetera, stuff like that. And we also train the student to create, you know, in urban science. I think the word trains is a little bit uh, overstatement. We just pretty much introduce some of the big data and one year program. But they are all very good, so we are very happy with that. So uh, why big cities? So the thing is that 50% uh, of the world population is uh, living in cities nowadays. And that number will rise to 80% uh, in 40 years. In fact, in North America, we already have 80% of people living in urban area, right? And uh, we're going to go to 90% in 2050. So the cities are where the resources are consumed and, you know, and uh, all of those uh, economic activities happen. So at CUSP, we always say that cities are the cause of our problem. So that, because when you grow a cities, they will lead to a scalability in like a how to deal with transportation, the housing, pollution, etc., like that. But that's also where we really find our solution. Uh, it is pretty much that because only in urban area we do have infrastructure to collect the data and have the data to really instrument and do our research on the cities. So. Um, Based on those data, we can really make it more efficient, sustainable. And there's a, a couple of good examples on how big urban data has been used in the past. I'm showing here just with some success stories. So one bus away, everyone knows about this, right? So pretty much this, this app will let you sit at the bus stop and tell you how long the bus is going to come, predict, just a predictive model, model. And based on that uh, time, it will suggest you, let's walk to the next stop instead of sitting here and wait. Right? And so do it by doing that, the riders also have a, a feeling that they wait less, and so they're more healthy. So this app was a big success because they make use of historical data of bus, uh, bus time in the past, uh, including with the current bus location, and they have very good uh, predictive models to suggest the right time of the bus coming next. And uh, because of that, uh, you know, 90% the, the increase in satisfaction from riders really increased, while 78 people walk more. And, um, so, so let's say all this is thanks to like the big urban data analysis on the back end. Because we've done that, if you predict something wrong, like I, I walk from my stop to the next stop and the bus pass by, then you really screw up the entire thing. So this is really carefully uh, managed and it's a big success. So one, another example is with the, uh, the mayors 
surface of data analytics and the uh, illegal version uh, data. So, so back in the 2005, right, we start back then. Okay. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, so. So illegal conversion is that when you take a unit or an apartment in New York and try to split it up to like as many sub smaller units, and now you try to increase the number of tenants, right? Number of people living that as many as time tenants as they're supposed to. So this really causes a fire hazard, and because all of the, the extending cord, you know, they're hanging everywhere, it's blocking the exit, uh, exit door, for example. And um, in 2005, there was actually two firefighters die because they. They try to help people in these, uh, these house. So this was posing as a very serious problem to the cities. And Mike Flowers, uh, who was uh, the head of the NYC model at the time, now he is an urban science fellow at CUSP. He really wanted to solve this problem by using big data. So uh, the, problem is, the root of this problem is that you know, there's about 25,000 illegal conversion reports or complaints every year in New York City, but they only have 200 inspectors to do the jobs. So they go out, they check every single place, and if the place is really uh, severe, very serious uh, issues with fire hazard, they will issue a, a vacate uh, order. But the thing is that when they come out, there are many places that don't really need that uh, attention yet. It's just a like, very simple like, illegal conversion. It wouldn't really cause a fire hazard yet. Why there's those places they haven't touched yet really more, really more urgent, need more priority. So. The, so uh, Flowers Group, they really look through all of the data. They try to put a priority into these um, the, the orders of where the inspector should go first to check for the places. So what they did is that they take the data from 19 different agencies, from late taxes, uh, foreclosure proceedings, and, and you know like like uh, ambulance and all those records, and com combine with the five years of, of fire data to see which place will likely have. Uh, a chance to causing you know, a fire and would really have some real accidents. And by doing that, they really increase the hit rate from 30% to 70%, which means like whenever like seven times out of 10, when the inspector go out to a place and check for the place, if it is really like uh, serious, they will issue a vacant order, which means that they choose a priority right, uh, much better. So this really improves the safety of the city. So, so these two are really two success stories, but they are very few. And did a very few and uh, far in between, right? Because uh, analyzing big urban data is really difficult. Because the cities is complex. It has different components, like infrastructure, which is bridges, roads, tolls, etc., and environment, which is just the pollutions, the weather, all these uh, factors, and especially people. They uh, how they move, you know, their mobilities, their health, nutrition. In order to really analyze the, the urban data, we need the data from all these components. So, so that is why there's a lot of initiative like you know, NYC Open Data or DataGov make this data available. But uh, the thing is that in order to really solve this, we need a domain expert. And domain expert, when they look at this you know, variety, complex data, they really don't know what to do with that because it requires a lot of uh, you know, expertise and it's, it's a really a scalability issue. So why is, is it hard? So scalability, yes, but not only for computations. Scalability, uh, scalability problem in computations is uh, challenging, of course, but it's something we have been dealing with uh, forever, right? Because we have simulation data in physics, chemistry, bio, since like 30 years, 40 years, who knows? And it's always much larger than your machine. So there's some way techniques in distributed computing, parallel databases, that uh, you know, we've been working on since the past. So it's challenging, but it's not new. And now we will have Hadoop. We just do very easy thing, just put more machines and so solve it more. Those are not the best way to solve it. I'm just saying, but uh, we can do that, right? So the, the real challenging part is the people, scalability in the people. In order to transform the data into some good knowledge, some knowledge that can be useful, we need to go through a very complex process that requires a lot of expertise in different domains. Could be like, you know, provenance, data management, algorithms, or visualizations. And we cannot fit this into a single domain expert, a single person, or a small group of people. And, uh, in addition, you no, know, the road from data to knowledge is not a straight line. It's really bumpy. It's really just a big messy rope, right? Because you need to tweak these together. How to integrate, you know, data management to visualization to algorithms, such thing like that. And if you do something wrong, it's messed up the whole thing. So this is a problem with uh, analyzing urban data, but not. It doesn't matter. Is it big or small? It's always there because it's the complexity of the data. It's not really the size of the data. So. Uh, 
So, but uh, if we notice that, you no, know, this box we cannot fit into a, a person. We can really encapsulate all of those into a tools or uh, some techniques that a person can use. So this is really the way that uh, our research group really, really want to head into, right? We want to build uh, scalable tools, uh, scalable techniques that make it very easy for domain experts, domain scientists to use the tools with all the machine learning package already, data management package already. They just use the tool to do their jobs, whatever they're good at. So they don't really need us in the loop anymore. We, sh we build a tool, ship it to them, and they will, we, you know, and we don't require them to have a CS training background. So they can have social scientists, government employees, or citizens, and this tool should be able to look at historical data, current data, and try to help them to build uh, you know, some knowledge about the futures or try to really improve the city. So to illustrate this, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, or talk about one of our recent work in the taxi V's, in particular in the taxi data. So uh, probably you've already heard about taxi data enough, right? So, so, so let me just summarize. So taxis uh, have been collected since uh, 2008 from the TLC, Taxi Living Commissions. Every time we enter a taxi, they will record our location pickup and drop off along with the durations, uh, other attributes like, you know, like how far you went, how many people in the car, and how much you pay for fare and tips, etc. cetera. Uh, so the taxis are really just transactional you know, records. They're not really sensors. But however, however, they have spatial and temporal components. They can act as a sensor for the cities and really show us how the city lives, right? So a number of questions uh, we can ask, for example, what is the average trip time from midtown to airports during weekdays? That can really tell us like the traffic conditions. Or we can ask like where are the popular night spot uh, during on a Monday night or Wednesday night? This could be posed as you know uh, human activities. So all these questions can be really answered with just taxi data. So if you look uh, and also at sorry and also at the um, macro and micro level, right? So if you look at the, the plot on the top, so this is uh, taxi data at the micro level, micro. So um, I'm, I'm plotting the number of trips per day for the entire years of 2011 and 2012. So if you see, we can clearly see right away there's a big dip during August 2011 and also a big dip in, uh, in October 2012. So these are really when the city has no sign of life. So this makes sense because those are when the hurricane hit New York, right? So there was no activities at all during that time. And we, or we can look at Christmas, for example, like the all the way to, the, to December, we, we just stay home, we don't really go out, so then the city is, is really empty. So that, that's really a sensor at a micro level. So at a, a micro level, so uh, if I'm plotting the taxi trips on the maps like this, um, so the blue dots are the pickup and the orange dots are the drop off, and I'm plotting in four hours on May 1st, 2011. So by looking through the hours, you can clearly see that uh, at 8 a.m., uh, the entire 6th Avenue was blocked indicating that there was some event going on there. And, and actually, there was the, the fiber road tours that happening during that, that Sunday, and they, they really plucked the entire road. So, so these uh, data can really tell us more about like, the micro level, like what's really happening at that particular place and particular time. So the challenge with uh, exploring this data is, of course, the size, the complexity as well. So, uh, so during the, 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 the five years, they had collected 500,000 uh, trips per day. So it's add up almost 800 uh, million trips for the entire period. And if, if you notice, right, this plot uh, on the top, very simple, but it took us 20 minutes to using Python code to scan through the entire data on a single uh, laptop to produce that plot, 20 minutes. Of course, we also run on Hadoop as well. Uh, also use Python streaming. It took two minutes, but we use 1,000 cores, which is a lot of resources. So in order to, to uh, make this such a plot, there's a lot of processing power needed. And this is really a challenge. If you give this to a, to a domain expert, they won't be able to run it on their environment. They don't have the code expertise or they, you know, the, the tools or the resources to do that. So, uh, so, so anyway, so the government policy makers, the scientists are really unable to, uh, to process this data. And we talk to the TLC and the DOT folks, directly the agency, not just like uh, s s someone at our place. So the data is complex because uh, they have spatial, temporal components, not only one, but two. They have pick up and drop off. And in, in order to query or uh, extract these information, it's really uh, a challenge. Uh, I will talk a little bit later why it's a challenge. And uh, along with that, we have about uh, 12 attributes of other things to index in the database. Of course, too many slices for people to select as well. So our goal is to build a tool that can have a very useful interface, easy for a scientist to explore this data uh, interactively query the data as well. So that is the, the text tool. 
So that's, that's a, this is a, just a summary of the list of features we have in the tools, but in summary, there's only two things important here. That we have a, a, a set of visual operations that the scientists or the domain experts can really click things on, on the screen, draw something on the map, and select the data, and they drill down with the, and see the result with the plus visualizations. The other thing is we build a very fast and efficient database backend that can really serve the, the, the data in an interactive speed, right? So, so without saying too much into this, I can show the, the, the actual demo. So let me. So this is video, but I don't, I'm not going to show the video. So you see this is my console. I do programming here. All right. So. So this is uh, the, the text series applications. So just uh, notice so all of the data are sitting on my laptop. The entire three years, we'll have three years, 2010, sorry, 2009, 11, and 12 on my laptop. It takes about 30 gigabytes of data. So everything is running locally, except the map. We draw the map from Google Maps, so that's why we need internet. But other than that, everything is locally, rendered locally, and processed locally. So um, what I'm showing here is a query for one hour of taxi data. So the blue dots are showing the pickup and red dots are showing the drop off, right? So if I, so this is showing the, the, the micro example here. So if I'm doing this, I'm just pressing through the, the hours. You can see, right, at 8 a.m., the entire 670 was blocked. All these are done in real time with real querying. And then at 10 a.m., they, they get back normal again. The, so let me go for more data. This may go for... Let me go for a week of data. I can just uh, put in the time constraint here and click queries. So there's quite a few of data there. So at the bottom, so these are so like the, the plus that, that we saw before the, the, at the macro level. So we have like the, the number of trips per time. We can clearly see the activities of uh, the taxi throughout the entire week. And there's always a dip, you know, at uh, around, let's say, 4, 3.45, 4 p.m. every day. That's happening because, you know, that is a, so that is a time when, uh, sorry, uh, that is a time when um, the taxi has to go back to the garage, right? So they don't really want to pick up the passengers unless you go their way. So this is why all the deep happening at 4 p.m. Okay, all right. So uh, one good, one um, one of great features that we, we put in this uh, application is the ability to query uh, space, which means people can really draw on the maps. So what I just did there is just I query all the trips starting from the West Village. And this happened in real time. So now the plus only show the trips during in that region. And if I want to show more, for example, all the trips from Upper East Side, I can do another one. So now in the plus, you can see the comparison between two different regions. They are actually two different queries. One that's starting from the Upper East Side, and the other one starting from the uh, West Village. And you can see in the plot, probably there's more pickups in the Upper East Side than the West Village during this week. And uh, if we want more restriction, we can also do uh, this, which showing only showing me trips starting from West Village that going to up east side. So now the plot is changed. So, so the ability to query the data set based on the regions in the, the application is really helpful for, for the scientists at DOT and TOC. I go back to the normal one. So instead of showing that, we can also show hit maps. So instead of showing points, we also show them hit maps. So this is showing the, the hotspot through the week, right? Oh, sorry, let's see, just show pickups right there. So these are really hot hotspot of the cities. You can see like there's more pickups happening on the avenue than on the street through this hit map, and these are really the the place that having a lot of traffic is uh, Penn stations. Authority and Grand Central stations, which is very obvious. But this is just to confirm the hypothesis. So uh, this is a tool can be used to you know, exploring the, the, the data. Another thing is that, uh, so now I can query the entire year worth of data inside the tool too. So let me show that.
So just that. It's the entire year worth of data. 180 million points has shown up on, you know, in this heat map. And, and so, so, so actually, in our data structure, we, we treat each of the point as a, you know, each of the trip as a point in hyperspace anyway. So, so some interesting thing with this is that if I put here 365, so look at how fast the plot is generated. So instead of doing just a simple script, a, a linear script that took you know, 20 minutes to generate this plot, in our, in our system, it's done in real time. This is because we do also like, you know, a multi-core as well, but we also have some te technology on the, the, the hyperflow, which is a parallel data, data flow architecture to run this, this task. But anyway, so this generates the exact same plot as we saw before. 2011, this is Irene, and this is Christmas, this is Thanksgiving. And there are also a number of uh, interesting queries. For example, if I want to reverse query, if I want to show instead of you know like where the capsule uh, when they land at the airport, I can do like um, selecting. So I'm selecting all the trips starting from uh, the Wadia. and JFK. So this is showing the trip starting from that region, but now I want to do the reverse query. I want to see where they go during this entire period of time. I can select the destinations and do, say, queries. So now show me the heat map of where all the trips starting from this region went to, right? And if we really normalize this, like that, so these are really the true hotspot of the cities when the visitor come to the, the, the airport and they go to this place. Any wild guess where this place are? MoMA. So, yeah, so, so probably, it, yeah, it's close, but uh, the thing that they did not exactly go to MoMA, I guess, they go to the one next to MoMA, which is a Hilton. So all of these are hotels, right? Yeah, yeah. So these are like the, uh, the Sheraton right here, and down here we have the Marriott and Intercontinental. So, so it makes sense. They come to the airport, they go back to their hotel, <laughs> and then before they go to different places. I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah, but probably. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. So, so, so this is a number of things here, right? So, the the rendering engines of the heat maps are done in OpenGL, and the interface are done in Qt, and the maps we we're using a JavaScript embedded browser for the maps of Google Maps inside. So, pretty much, we draw Google Maps at the bottom, and we do OpenGL on top. Yes, and this plot, uh, yes. Oh, it's cut off? Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, oh, so I've been doing, yeah, sorry, so I've been using this to select like destination and you know, and then, okay, so, so, so that's the magic of the screen, I guess, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. So, so we can also see that there's are more trips going to LaGuardia than to JFK in, in any case. And uh, so, so these two, they can look at multiple attributes at the same time. Yeah, probably, yeah. I have, I have no idea. So, so for example, like, uh, instead of showing the number of trips, I can show like the tips amount, you know, like the the miles or how the average speed for the plots. Not just a single attribute, but they're entirely up to fourteen attributes. And uh, and the, the DOT, they're using this by export this after they do data selection. They can export for do further analysis by doing this. So there's an export function can export to CSV, MATLAB, no, Mat Mat sorry, MATLAB, etc. Okay, so. So that's pretty much the, the, the demo there. So let me go back to the thing here. Let me do that here. Oops, oops. Okay. So just to just to recap the the the, 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 um, the features of the tool, right? So if we don't have a visual operations in order to query such a trip, like you know, show me all trips going from Times Square to Gramercy, you have to write very as I said, very tedious uh, SQL command, a statement like this on the left. You must know your attributes name, you must know like your time and what is uh, the, the table name and how to define a region. If you use Postgres, you have to really define the polygon of the time square and that is not easy. Uh, so, so our tools pretty much let users select the data slides directly on the UI, go through the spatial, temporal, and attribute constraints. So for example here, the time is specified by the, the, the top panel and then the spatial by just drawing the region there, and in the end, we have like the data result 
show unify with uh, color lines matching. And we can also select regions by predefined polygons. I think I forgot to show this. Well, pretty much, like we can load a, a predefined set of polygons with zip code, neighborhood, and we can just do selection right there. Or we can do free selection, that's, uh, we, which I showed, and we can group them together. Which means like, I can show like, trips starting from both airports at the same time as a single query instead of two queries. Right? And here's the uh, selecting time. There are also the, the features, not a tab that can do uh, recurrent time patterns. Instead of selecting time by just a, a continuous re uh, period, we can do like all Tuesday uh, on September 2011, for example, so those queries. And again, we can do like, you know, attribute selection, even on the plots, you can also select the regions you want interest, and they will narrow down the number of trips returned to the, to the scientists. All right, so, so these are the class, that, so let's say, these are spatial temporal data, and there's also a work before from Perquet that she defined the triad, the query triad, which means like, in order to support interactive uh, exploration of spatial temporal data, you need to support this class of queries. When, where, and showing what, or when, what, showing where, like you know, where are the hotspots in Manhattan in weekends, like giving the, the when, the time, and, and uh, the attributes you want to look, uh, your, is a constraint, you know where it is. So our system support all three types of, uh, of, class, of query classes and more. We can do when and go to the other two, so something like that. And to make it simpler, so, uh, so here just to show an example. So this is just, I think it's a little bit redundant here. So when is for the time, the map is for where, and you know, the what is for, sorry, the where is for the map, and then the what is for um, the attributes. And composing the queries, can selecting directly on the maps, link them together, etc. Here's some examples that can be done with the tools, like showing all the trips going from Lower Manhattan to, you know, to uh, the two airports, but now com comparing them side by side, so we can have two windows in the same tools at the same time. And if you look at the scatter plot at the bottom, it's showing that uh, the red dots are go to JFK, right? So it's showing that um, on the Monday. From 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., the time that it takes from Lower Manhattan to the airport is, is much increased compared to Sunday. It also makes sense. This is just a very you know, trivial, sorry, very uh, obvious like, conclusion because uh, there's traffic during that time. So, we, so this is just another use case. We can select the, by neighborhoods and compare between them. Like uh, there's almost no taxi surf in the Harlem, so they're really underserved, as showing in the, the, the little bottom map there. So here is one example that we can really show the, how Sandy was recovered in Manhattan and Brooklyn. So Sandy hit in New York in, uh, I think on uh, Monday, you know, October 29th, and then, uh, and then just two days after that, they're gone. But if you look at the Brooklyn, they recover pretty fast right away on the Wednesday uh, 31st. But if you look at the Manhattan, only the upper part gets recovered. The lower part of Manhattan is still really empty. There's no activities there until Saturday. So because there was a really huge power outage in the lower Manhattan when Sandy happened in New York. So they really slowly recover. <laughs> so this is something trivial, I guess, just showing the uh, hotspot. So, so using this tool, you know where to go at a certain time, I guess. Or avoid certain crowd. So, so let's go, go back to the, the really, uh, the, the, let's see, the engine behind that, the plumbing, right? So the, the the thing that really allow us to do this type of really fast interactive queries is really the data mesh part. That we really be very efficient one. We, we didn't really want to build our own database uh, backend, but we really try on a, a number of techniques. Like we, we try uh, SQLI, we try Postgres, and also some commercial database that I showed a little bit later. But if, as you look at the statistic here, right? Uh, the Postgres and uh, SQLI took almost like two gigabyte of this space and the, the time to really index the data, like 13 hours for just one year. And you know, but, but the, the real problem is that in during the, the query performance, where we just do a very simple query performance for like 1,000 you know, trips, I mean, the result size, 1,000 trips, it takes like three seconds already, which is really b below our interactive speed. We, we want somewhere like uh, order of seconds. And if we go a little bit larger, it takes like 24 seconds. So it, it's really slow. And uh, in order to solve our problem in interactive queries, we uh, build our own index, you know, our own in-memory database that uh, have comeback representations. It's based on the KD trees. There's a lot more technical details I can point to the paper, but pretty much we reduce the, uh, the size of the, the database to 30 gigabytes. And the building time, half an hour. 
why the uh, query performance is really much faster, like uh, an order of magnitude faster. Based on that preliminary work, we also have a GPU-based index, which means we're using the GPUs to index these uh, data, and it's now get to you know, two orders of magnitude faster. So for example, we can also compare here to a commercial database. I don't want to name the, the name of the database. But you can see it's like almost 2,000 times faster than Postgres or that commercial database. And our index was integrated into MongoDB. So it's not just TextFeeds anymore. We put the index into MongoDB so we can use for other apps, you know, servers uh, and web servers. And it's really faster. So the question is, why are these RDBMS so slow? Because they wasn't designed for this purpose. So actually, the spatial index is just some add-on that they add you know, later on. Like, and they're supposed to do for a small set of data, not really for like, sensors type data like taxi. And uh, they only work with one, you know, one attribute. And then we have two attributes in taxi data. And uh, so they need to join. So on the, on the right, you're going to see the query planner for the order to statement. So that's why they have to join on the, all the locations. And then they also join on destinations. This is just a lot of work. And also, the, there will be a lot of point and polygon tests, which means when we draw our regions, we need to test if a point really inside that region. And that's also very expensive. So uh, there's about 6 million tests for just like 13,000 points. So to so wrap up with the status of the tech CVs, we demo at uh, NYC DOT and uh, TOC. They are currently using our prototype. And so th this, this was last year when we demoed the tools to them. The next day, they come back and say that they were truly blown away. Because this is really the first time they saw, they saw this type of tool. It wasn't because that they don't know about databases. It's because of the, they haven't really get any good indexing out of the data. And they always take time. Like They put the, the, the they put a task there on the machine, and they come back in the next day or you know, half an hour later, or they really have to, to sample the data, which you will lose out all of those events, special events, if you sample the data. And now we, ex we have expanded this to a number of different data types, like uh, you know, uh, energy usage or real estate uh, property license, et cetera. And, um, and we really want to improve the scalability by using more uh, larger environments, like running on the back end of, uh, not Hadoop, but more like a, uh, an MPI uh, architecture for interactive. And w we envision that this is a platform for our, you know, for, that's for urban GIS. I see that. And this is, there's a whole list of uh, the tasks we want to do with tech service. But if you look, so this is just screen capture of our project management system. So this part is very important. So we are working on be a, a Python binding for text CVs. That's because um, visual is not always the way for, for the, the analyst uh, to do analysis, right? Because after they do data selection, they like their selection, they want to run the same thing again for all of the days, right? So now they need a mechanism to do the batch jobs, do a scripting. So, so we need to build a thin API with some scripting, of course, Python. So, so this is still on our task, and we are working on this. We, of course, we are you know, actually looking for collaborations you know, and suggestions on how to do this. So finally, just to, uh, to conclude this. So data exploration, especially in the urban environment, is challenging either small or large because of data complexity. And the key here is that to build a tool that's really easy for domain experts to use, to, to really get them into the loop of the data processing. And visualization is a powerful tool. Because if you look at all the, 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 the plot for the micro and micro example, if there was no maps or no plot, it's really hard for you to see if there's an event missing in Sick Avenue or not. So visualization is really play a key part here. Pictures have us think, that's what I say, yeah. And to do interactive visualization is really also more challenging because you need to work with data management part. And finally, we want to adopt you know, scripting with Python. I still love Python. So, so, so that will be all. If you have any questions, then I'll take it. Yes? So actually, so actually, we did this. We just download from the, the share files online, right? So for example, with the, the Zillow, they have the, the share files for all the neighborhoods. It's publicly available. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, yeah. So right now, it's open to collaborators. So for example, like we de deploy this at TLC, DOT, they have full access to applications. But the only reason that we didn't put it like GitHub like that because uh, there's a lot of uh, small steps, like, uh, and some of the data that we use was not the uh, FOI data because we we interact with TLC before they they make the taxi data FOI, so it was some private stream data as well. But we really, you know, 
we have no really uh, tried hiding the, the source code. It's really open, yeah. Oh no! So some MongoDB doesn't have uh, the, the the real spatial index, right? Uh, well, it might not have. Mm -hmm. it uh -huh. Oh, that's interesting. So we could test. The thing is that, uh, yes, yeah, so, so very very good point. So I think at the, the time we didn't have that, but we would try. Yeah. It might be the same because they did KD3. Yeah, because uh, we use the KD3 not only for the spatial because it can support the arbitrary number of dimensions. So which means like we also index the attributes, not just the spatial. So we have spatial, time, and then the tips, fair, all of them in 12 dimensions. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah, so for example, so, 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 so one of our work is to do Twitter data. So Twitter, they have spatial and time, but they also have keywords. So our index, I haven't shown here, but also work with keywords, which means we try to transform the text into a number and do, using the same infrastructure for mapping the data. So, so it, pretty much any data source that can have, you know, let's say, in the Euclidean space, which means it has a number, can be indexed in, in this framework.